just a number. Black is just a color. The world is collided into chaos. Beautiful souls try to mend it and heal it. He is a beautiful soul. His inspirations are his way to make a difference. His work of art is usually compared to Gibran Khalil Gibran, the Lebanon poet, writer of the prophet. African-American legacy is a blend of masterpieces and beautiful souls. Martin Luther King, Maya Angelou, and Johnny Ray Moore are icons of African-American history. He was so humble to share his work and inspirations. Mr. Johnny, good afternoon and welcome today. Yes, Mr. Johnny, do you hear us? Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, there is a problem, I think, with the, the sound. Uh, can you hear him? I don't know. There is a problem with the sound. Oh, I cannot hear him. Just you, Raja. I yes, cannot hear him. Mr. Johnny, we can't hear you, all of us. Me too. I don't uh, really listen to the sound. Yes? I don't hear too. Okay. Neither do I. Here we go. Yes, now it's perfect. So greetings from Tunisia. Now and greetings from all the country in our project, from Denmark, Portugal, Albania, Romania, Turkey. <laughs> greetings, one more time. Everyone can hear me? Yes, perfect, great, wonderful. Great. Yes? Okay, great. My name is Johnny Ray Moore. I am a poet, a children author, a greeting card writer, and songwriter. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share a few of my books with you. I write for, my specialty is writing for the very young. Uh, I'm talking about the toddlers, preschoolers, first graders, second graders. That's my specialty. But I also write for older children and I write for adults as well. All right. I think I did mention I am a songwriter also. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my website so that you can at least, I'm going to show my books to you, but you can go to my website and take a closer look at some of my books. Okay. So if you're ready, my website is www.johnnyraymore.com. That's Johnny Ray Moore with no periods in between my name. That's www. Johnny Ray Moore dot com. I don't know if you all have ever ordered books from America, children books. I am a children author for the most part. But if you should be interested in uh ordering and in my books, you can do so directly through my website. All right. Okay. Because I am so, well, first, first, let me, let me thank Mrs. Raja thank for reaching you. out to me. You know, she is a very, very, very warm person. She made me feel so welcome and I was really, really thrilled. <laughs> so I must say, Thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure. Also, uh, my first, the first thing I'm gonna read to you is a poem entitled Teachers because I am so fascinated and thrilled by teachers. This poem shows my appreciation uh, for teachers, all right? Again, the title of the poem is Teachers. As the days pass quickly by, just like a movie feature, throughout this world of gifted souls, we know you as our teachers. You are no doubt our frontline troops. You get so little praise, but still you do what you do best, ensuring better days. You do more than we'll ever know. Your knowledge is the key. You thrive to help each one of us fulfill our destiny. The world will be a total mess without the things you do. 
your savvy ways and intellect flow endlessly from you. Now I must share what's in my heart. This is my own confession. Your dedication means so much to teach is your obsession. Your priceless charm and gentle touch help many find their way. It has to be almighty God who's with you day by day. And come what may, you stay the course. You have a giving heart. For sure, you are sun rays of hope. I'm thrilled that you're so smart. So please don't feel that you're forgotten in your darkest hour. It's in those times when all seem lost. God gives you strength and power. And that's the poem, teachers. I hope you enjoyed it. All right. Best gift ever to teachers. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, the first book I'm going to read and share. You may have seen it uh, on YouTube already. It's entitled The Story of Martin Luther King Jr. I, I hear something keep beeping. Is, is... No, no, we have pupils entering the Zoom meeting. Oh, that's Don't what it is. Okay, okay. Yes. All, right. All, right. All, right. all right. The story of Martin Luther King Jr. It is a 200 word board book. And it is, it's a best selling classic. The book has sold well over 103,000 copies and it continues to sell. Uh, before long, it's going to be translated into a few foreign languages. Amazing, yes. Okay. So again, the story of Martin Luther King Jr. The book is published by Worthy Kids. Worthy Kids. If you when you go to my website and you look on the book, you will see uh, who published the book. Yes. And I don't know who the illustrator was of this, this edition. This is the third edition of that book mm -hmm. because the book has sold so well. The first edition looked like this. Yes. The text is the same. The illustrations are different. Yes, the cover book and so on, yes. Mm -hmm. So then it went from that, the first to the second edition. It's a little bit bigger than the first edition. Yes. And, and I hope you all can see my book okay. No, no, I hope it's I'm wonderful. Doing... It's perfect. Yes, it's perfect. Great, great. Yeah. Okay. So this is, so far, the third and probably the final edition, I would imagine. Right. The story of Martin Luther King Jr., written by Johnny Ray Moore. Every January, we celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. Do you know why we remember him? Martin was born in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. His father was a preacher. His mother was a school teacher. Martin liked to go to school. He always did more than his teachers asked him to do. Martin's school was old. It needed a lot of fixing. The school for the white children was new. Martin and his mom and dad liked to eat out, but some restaurants would not serve them. Martin could not drink from all water fountains. 
he had to find one with a sign that read colored. This made Martin angry. He wanted to go to the best school. He wanted to eat at any restaurant and he wanted to drink from any water fountain. When Martin grew up, he became a preacher. One day he spoke to more than 200,000 people. Martin said, I have a dream that my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin. Martin made his dream come true. Now we can all eat at any restaurant. drink from any water fountain, go to any school, and dream our dreams just like Martin Luther King Jr. And that's the end of that book. Wonderful. I like the illustrations. They are very attractive. Yes. Thank you, thank you. At this time, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share a poem that I wrote about Dr. King and it's kind of based on this book. And the reason I wanna read this poem to you is because when President Barack Obama was in office, Yes. I wrote the poem. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know why I wrote it, but I wrote it and I decided to send it to him. Yeah. I sent it to the White House. I sent it to the White House. And in a few weeks, I received a letter from uh, President Barack Obama. Yes. It was a very nice letter. So I'll, I'll very, it's something that I, I frame. I'm not gonna leave, I'm not gonna read the letter to you, but it's, uh, I was kind of shocked. <laughs> but anyway, the poem is entitled, Honoring a Legacy of Blackness. When Dr. King was here with us and said, I have a dream, so many stood and trusted him. They were a chosen team. Side by side, they prayed and marched the goals were very plain. They fought for pure equality that ushered in a change. Some before and after them made strides for civil rights. Now we must do our very best to stay the course and fight. Our black ancestors gave us hope. They set a grueling pace. They worked and prayed and sacrificed and vowed to win this race. They paved the way for us to be whatever we desire. Their blood was shed throughout the world, therefore we must aspire. Then one day we unified, our courage somewhat spent. Our precious votes made sure we got our first black president. We are a world of kindred souls. Let's work to help each other. And during times we disagree, we must not kill our brothers. Instead, let's prove to all the world and to our children too, with prayer and faith and godly grace, there's nothing we can't do. Wonderful, I had goosebumps, really, it's wonderful. It's Thank reminiscent of all the struggle in the civil societies and civil movements and so on, wonderful. You summarize it in a very simple childhood way, wonderful. Uh, yes. 
as, uh, as a writer, uh, because I started out uh, writing poetry. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you all how old I am. I just turned 66 years old on the 13th of March. God bless wrote, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I wrote my first poem when I was in the third grade. Mm -hmm. I knew as a child that I was, I was creative. I had my imaginary friends, yeah. uh, you know, my little people and all this good stuff. Uh, I played alone a lot. I was very shy. But anyway, as time went on, I, when I got in the uh, fifth grade and sixth grade, yeah. I took a course uh, in creative writing. Actually, I was in the eighth and ninth grade in higher grades, but even young, younger, I started to read about writers and creative people and all this kind of stuff. And I kept right on writing poetry. I read and I wrote poetry. So anyway, anyway, uh, that's how I got, I'm a little bit better known than my poetry, known for my poetry than for just my regular books. Yes. Uh, it, so it made it, it made it somewhat easy for me to write the story of Martin Luther King Jr. in just 200 words. Mm -hmm. That's what, the, that's what the publisher wanted mm -hmm. because it is a, it's a board book. Yes. Okay, so after I had written that, that one, the yeah. publisher wanted me to write a picture book about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's a, it's a longer book. It is actually 1,200 words. I'm not going to read that to you. Okay. I said I'm going to show you uh, some of the books that I have written. I'm going to do that right now. My first book was, my first book was Howie has a stomach ache. Mm -hmm. It's about a pig. It's about a pig who has a stomach ache. Yes. <laughs> the book is only 100 words, and the book did such a good job after about a year and a half that the book was translated into Spanish. So there's the English version mm -hmm. and the Spanish version. Uh, also, the book continued to do so well that about. about Three years ago, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, yeah. the book appeared on uh, national news here in the United States. Yeah, All right. That's great. Yeah. So from from that from that experience, the book went to a show called the Steve Harvey Show. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know it. Yeah, I watch it. Yes. Okay, great, great. I I am one of his fan of his biggest <laughs> fan, by the way. <laughs> Great. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so after that book, I wrote a book entitled A Leaf. A Leaf, a leaf Falling from a Tree. Yes. Now, I love this book. Well, I love all my books, but this book has some very good illustrations. If you can mm -hmm. see the colors. Yes. A Leaf. It's about a leaf falling from a tree. This book is only 88 words. Okay. Only 88 words. All right. After that book, then that's when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. After this one, I wrote, But Still We Dream. But Still We Dream. Yes. But Still We Dream is a novel in verse. Yes, it's a novel, okay? Yes. Novel in verse, all right? Mm -hmm. After that book, Silence, Please, mm -hmm. a collection of children poems. Yes. This book is written strictly for uh, uh, kindergarten age kids and first graders and second graders. But okay. I, I, like, I like this book. And I, I, I'm going to read a bit of it for you later, a little later. After this book, Ant Hill for Sale. Yeah. Ant Hill for Sale. It's about, it's about an ant couple and their three daughters who are trying to sell their ant hill. 
I read an extract in your Facebook page. It was a very wonderful uh, story. There is a morale behind the use of animals and insects. Yes, a beautiful morale, yes. Well, thank you. I'm, this one I am going to read to you okay. uh, in, in just a few minutes, all right? And then after that book, so many questions. So mm -hmm. many questions. You can see the cover of the book, okay? Yes. So many questions is a rhyming picture book that will introduce young children to historical figures of honor who have made noteworthy contributions to the world. The book will give its readers an up-close view of the first black female pilot, the inventor of the mailbox, the first black female astronaut, a leading black ballerina, a senior pastor of a church who served as a senator at the same time, and a tennis superstar, just to name a few. So many questions will surely be remembered by many because of its rhyming text. Furthermore, after reading this book, children and adults just might discover a bit of genius that is within us all. Again, I'm going to read this book uh, a little later also, all right? Uh, Mr. Johnny, is it the book you told me uh, it's about uh, the famous women in Hidden Figure, the film we talked about uh, yes. last time? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, great, great. Mm -hmm. I think I'll be buying this book. Well, great, great. It, it is, uh, uh, what, and one reason why I wrote this book is because every, uh, every Black History Month, every year, yeah. same like, we, we, we just hear about, some, for the most part, some of the same people. And there are so many others who you do not know anything about. I don't even know anything about some of them. I run upon them when I'm doing research. Yeah. So in researching for so many questions, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to shed some light on these people. I wanted to introduce these people to uh, look uh, children, to adults, yeah. I want their worth to be known. And uh, as I, I have told other writers of color that if this will happen, we will have to make it happen. We have to make it happen. So, and then I already have, I already have the second book mapped out and it's gonna be about, it will be about females. There will not be any males mentioned in that book because because you females have done some tremendous things. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And you continue to do so. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, but before I read anything else, I, I think I'm going to let some, if you want to ask some questions, you can do so now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? No. Okay. Let me check with the pupils. Okay. Right. So who would like, uh, as usual, you raise your hand. You have the icon on the Zoom. Okay. Let's start with Mariam. Yes, Mariam, go ahead. You can open your camera and uh, greet Mr. Johnny. Go on, if you want. Hi, Mr. Johnny, how are you? My name is Mariam Gaysmi. I'm 16 years old. I'm from Tunisia. I'm a student in Emma Shabbat Secondary School. I'm passionate about uh, reader and uh, technology. Um, I would ask you that, uh, do you think uh, that human rights uh, in America are guaranteed? They're, they're guaranteed? Yeah. Uh, no, they are not guaranteed. Uh, as, as I already know that you all have learned a bit about racism, about the civil rights movement about the injustices that continue to go on, not just in the United States, but kind of all over the world. To answer your question, that will be something that we will work to make better for the rest of our lives. It's kind of like good and evil. There's always going to be a group of somebody working to do what's right, to do, to do the good stuff. On the other hand, it's going to be that other crew. They don't care anything about, they will not care anything about 
doing what's right, being just, none of that. So because of that reason, it's, it's going to be a continuous fight. Absolutely. But let me tell you something. <laughs> People who want to do what is right are very resilient. They will come back again and again and again and again. And that's been the struggle here in America when it comes to minorities, when it comes to uh, people of color. It's a constant fight. And we will do just that. We will continue to fight for what's right, for what's just. And thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, uh, go ahead, Feta, go on. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, and uh, would you mind to tell us uh, what you feel about the misfortune that happened a few months ago? I mean, about uh, George Floyd's death. death. The death of uh, George Floyd. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, boy. It, it, it was terrible. Anytime, anytime anybody's life is taken, it's terrible. It was so senseless what happened. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really lost for words. I was, I was so angry. Not only me, so many Americans, black and white, all races, even in it filtered into other countries, as yeah. you did see on the TV. It was so ridiculous. See, but see, that's the kind of thing that. Racism, uh, not being united, not respecting one another, not respecting life, feeling privilege, all those things can cause that kind of thing to happen. And I only hope and pray that justice will be served. We pray with you too, Mr. Johnny. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, I move to Mathilde. Yes, Mathilde, go ahead. Uh, what do you think is the biggest difference in the daily life of the person of different ethnicity or race? I, I didn't differences? understand the first part of that. Could yeah. you repeat that? Yes, Mathilde, you what? your question, yes. What do you think is the biggest difference in your view of the daily life of a person of a different ethnicity or race? What do you think of the differences of a person of different ethnicity? Is it similar to the same mainstream society she means? Is it different? How is it different? Yeah. I talk about the other uh, ethnic groups, Mr. Johnny, not only the colored one. We say we have the Jews, we have many other minorities, right. yes. It, it, yes. It, it is, it's all very similar. I can't really detail, I can't really detail uh, the differences because, because it's just something that I don't understand. You see, yeah. I was raised, I was raised to respect people, to get along with people and anything outside of that, I just don't understand. Now I'm going, don't get me wrong now. I'm not going to show, but I'm going to stand my ground. I am going to fight for what I believe is the right, you see. But uh, what you just asked, I don't know. I don't know why the, the different races, the different uh, ethnicities are treated yeah. the way they are. Yeah. But uh, I can only say it should not be that way. And then if you, if you kind of, uh, go back in history from the from the beginning of time that's the way it's been yeah exactly. again again i don't understand it, but that goes back to what i said about a good group of people and that group of people that's going to work to do whatever to disrupt the good stuff yeah. it goes back to that however it got started uh, it's always going to be, and I cannot, I cannot, uh, I can't detail the difference in all that. All I know is it's not, it is not right. I understand what you, you are trying to explain. You are not in their shoes, so you can judge other ethnicities since you are not in their position. 
So you can't mm -hmm. judge. I see. Right. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, Thank who else you. would like to? Uh, I have Andra who is raising her uh, hand. Yes, Andra, go on. Your question, please. Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Indra, I am from Romania, and I really like the, your, um, your poetry, uh, because I'm passionate to write poetry sometimes too. I would like to ask you, how do you find your inspiration? Wow, my inspiration comes from life itself. You probably have heard what I've just said, ever since you've been writing poetry, but it just comes from everything that I do. I like to, I like to, aside from writing, I love nature. I love to garden. I love to grow uh, ornamental plants, ornamental shrubs. Uh, I love to exercise. I love to, I love to do so much stuff. In doing in doing all those things, I'm inspired. I get inspiration. I get inspiration from washing dishes, believe it or not. <laughs> washing dishes, from cleaning the house. In fact, uh, I have a I have a desk. I have this desk here, but in in the back over here, I have a stand up desk. Right. The reason I have a stand up desk because, for the most part, when it comes to inspiration. It, it comes while I'm mowing the grass or I'm doing some chore or I'm riding down the road. So I barely ever sit at the desk and write anything. It's always, uh, I'm on the move. I, and that came from when I was in the military. I was in the military, it was the very same thing. I kept a, a pen and paper, a little tablet on me. And when I got ideas, I will write them down. So to go back to your question, uh, my inspiration comes from all of life, all of life. And thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you, you for your answer. Okay. Thank you. So you Matthew, keep writing. Did you ask the question, Sophia, sorry. So Sophia now, go ahead. Your question, Sophia, I'm sorry for the mistake, yeah? Go on. Thank you. So some of my colleagues have some questions, but they weren't able to attend the meeting. Okay. So, Guilherme Peixot asked, what led you to choose to be a writer? Mm -hmm. What led you to choose to be a writer? Oh. Was it an ambition, a dream job? What led you to choose that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good question. I, uh, as I stated earlier, yeah. I realized that when I was young, this this was before I even got into the first grade, I realized that I was creative. I, I didn't know what was going on, but I entertained myself alone. I didn't have to be around people, look the children, to have fun. In some cases, I didn't have any toys anyway, for the most part. I didn't have a lot of toys to be entertained. So I knew I knew I was creative once I learned what the word creative meant. Yeah. I was just inspired to do so, so, so much. But uh, your, your question, what was your question again? What led you to be a poet okay. writer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what led me, we're reading, believe it or not, because I read, I would read, uh, I started reading uh, this one magazine that I used to love, and I still love it, but I don't read it as much. Yeah. It's entitled the, the Reader's Digest. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with that. I would, when I got a little older, I would buy a copy of the Reader's Digest, and I'd go through and read the articles, the various articles, mainly life in the United, life in the United States. Yeah. I read the comedy. Anyway, anyway, from the Reader's Digest, I would buy copies of the Reader's Digest when I could afford it. Okay. And I read the articles. But one section that I really, really loved was how to enrich your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. That was the page with the 20 words 
and the meaning of the words, the spelling of the words, and how to pronounce, pronounce the words. Self-taught, yeah. Yes, I love that. I love that. So yeah. for the most part, I started to study words. I started to sometimes in those uh, in that magazine, I read about other writers. Mm -hmm. And from that, because I knew I was creative and I had a bunch of stories and this and that, I figured I'd try my hand at writing. Okay. And that's how, that's how I got into writing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Thanks to you. Okay, so yes, I might go ahead if you have a question, yeah. Uh, hello, sir, nice to meet you. Uh, I have one question. Is there, is there anyone who helped you to become uh, a writer? Is anyone? Uh, is there anyone who helped you to become a writer? I think uh, creativity helped him. Yes, Mr. Johnny. Yes, it, nicely put. It was pretty much, it was pretty much my create, my creativity, my my burning desire yeah. to do something with. Uh, all the ideas. And then I was slowly learning that, I was slowly learning that somebody was writing these books. Somebody was writing these, somebody was writing the reading cards, somebody was writing these lovely poems that I was reading. And they weren't, they weren't poem, poems by famous people. Mm -hmm. They were just, just or, mean, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, the ordinary people. Oh, oh, let me, let me say, <laughs> let me say about myself. I'm just uh, an ordinary person. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm not fancy in no way whatsoever. Uh, and that's I'm, the true genius and creative poet. He is like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I, I could talk about that uh, more so to talk about my books. Yeah. Because, because I want, I want when I'm, when, before the pandemic and I was able to get out uh, in public, I wanted people to not be intimidated to talk to me yes you see so and, and another thing as i wrote and i started getting attention for from writing for writing mm -hmm. this and that i would not allow people to put me on a pedestal i didn't want them to think that i'm some big famous i'm not absolutely i'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a very simple individual again it's because of you that I can do some of what I do. If you would not talk to me, I would be like a knot on a log. I wouldn't be inspired because you all inspire me also. I was so thrilled that I would be able to uh, talk and see so many of you. It really is an honor. It's our pleasure to okay. and our honor, thanks. Right, so okay. back to his question. Back to his question. Uh, so who else? Ons, go ahead. Yes, your question, Ons. Hi, Mr. Johnny. I'd like to ask you, uh, what's the message behind your poem? What's the message behind your poems? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The message. Good question. It's, it's, it's such a simple mes message. Yeah. Uh, I am. The, the message is always to ask fire or empower somebody yeah. or unite us mm -hmm. and that's it there's no other there's no other anything yes uh i'm i'm, I'm going to recite for you a little poem okay, that, go ahead. that i that i uh <laughs> i taught to my grandson now i'm known i am known as grandpa daycare yeah. all right <laughs> it's because it's because i babysit my grandson who is four years old and i babysit his sister who is one she's about to turn two in may right? wonderful very cute yeah <laughs> i have a ball with them because they they love their grandpa and see, I've been I've been babysitting them for almost or Ethan ever since he was a, a little bitty baby. Mm -hmm. and, and because because I'm really, really good with kids, really, really good with children. 
Absolutely. You are an author's children. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> but but I get I get down there on the floor with them. Yeah. They ride on my back. I have to ride them on my shoulder. Uh, my grandson would tell me sometimes, he say, oh, he's on my back, he will say, and grandpa, be a mad cow. He want me to turn into a mad cow so I can yeah. start trying to yeah. buck him off my back, this kind of thing. But but <laughs> but anyway, they are very attached to me. I'm very attached to them. Right. So Ethan, uh he watch, he watched me read. Uh, he has a lot of books. We teach him a lot of stuff. He and his sister. So this poem mm -hmm. is entitled Toad. It's a very short poem. Near the pond, across the road, I have a friend. His name is Toad. Mm -hmm. He's always sitting on a log, but that's okay because Toad's a frog. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's frog, yeah. <laughs> I'm going I'm I'm to recite it again. Yeah. Near the pond across the road, I have a friend. His name is Toad. He's always sitting on a log, but that's okay because Toad's a frog. <laughs> the first few times that I was trying to teach it to him, he would look at me and just walk away. Yeah. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take, he wouldn't do anything. <laughs> well, now... He, he recites that poem, and then there's another poem that I'm teaching him. And now we begin, we're beginning to teach his sister poems also. That's great, yeah. Right? Yes. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> back to that question. I didn't, have any, I didn't have anybody to talk to about writing. Mm -hmm. I didn't. There was nobody. I learned mm -hmm. by reading. I've learned the most about writing by reading magazines about writing, reading books about other writers, mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of things. So, you know, through the years, it, it, it paid, it's paid off. And I tell any aspiring person who wants to write, especially that young lady who writes poetry, yeah. make sure you read. Oh, and for sure, read your own work. Read and study your own work. Of course, yeah. I, I, I do so constantly. I'm so... I'm so particular in what I've just said that when I sit down to write a poem, I go about writing a poem as though I have never written anything in my life. Yeah. That I'm not, I'm not even pub published. Mm -hmm. That's how serious it is because mm -hmm. again, I want to, I want to inspire somebody. I want to mm -hmm. empower them. And I want it in some way to unite us. Cause we are all the same. Yeah. We're here. We're here. We are here on planet Earth in different parts mm -hmm. of planet Earth, mm -hmm. but we are, for the most part, all the same. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. You inspired us too much this evening, by the way. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Who would like? Yes. Uh, Mia, if I pronounce the noun exactly. Mia or Mihai, I don't know. Go on, please. Go ahead. Mihai, thank Mihai. you for responding. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Michael. I am 14 years old. And uh, I have a question about uh, racism. There will be the ever suppressed racism in the world. Will there be? Could you repeat the question again? The first part, will there be what? Will there Michael, be? You hear me? Repeat, you repeat your question, repeat, Michael, please. Repeat it, repeat it. Oh, uh, there will be the ever suppressed racism. The ever? Suppressed. Suppressed, will. what do you mean by suppressed racism? Suppressed. You mean, do you mean, will we, will we, will we ever get, a, do away with it? Will we ever get rid of racism? Oh, uh, that's what you mean, Michael. That's what you're asking. Okay. Even when I was young, even when I was young, younger, a whole lot younger, I'm talking about even a child. I come to know that we will never get rid of racism. We'll never do it. We will 
it will get better. We will be able to uh, deal with it better. But unfortunately, it's a part of that evil versus good or good versus evil that I mentioned. You know, you got the good and you got the bad. Yeah. It's that kind it's that kind of thing. It's it, I guess it's kind of like uh how life to some degree mm-hmm. balances itself. Now we don't we don't want the bad. We prefer the good. But I tell I tell some people that I talk with that no, we don't want that bad stuff, but so many times that bad stuff helps us to appreciate the good. Look at look at what the pandemic has done, as terrible as it as it is. Absolutely. It it, it is making people, it has made people uh take a closer look at their themselves. Mm-hmm. I've done the very same thing. Yeah. We are vowing to do better. We're vowing to do better. Uh, amongst one another. So back to your question, I don't feel we'll ever get rid of it. It's going to be here to the end of our time. But I can assure you, we will continue to work to make it better. Good question. I totally agree with you, Mr. Johnny. Uh, earlier, you said already resilience. I think the resilience is the key to this struggle. Already the vast boycott of Rosa Parks, the civil rights amendment that you want, are just a result, concrete result of the resilience. So I think I think resilience is, is the good, the first step to winning this battle, unfortunately, which is between good and evil, as you mentioned already. That's right, exactly. Yeah. OK, uh, anyone else would like to ask a question? I don't know. Uh, our teacher partners, if you would like, Christina, Sunaf, anyone, Mary Louise, if you have any questions, why not? Go ahead, please. Yesin, uh, yeah, Yesin, go on. Your question. Uh, hi. hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, when you can tell uh, yourself uh, that you can uh, realize book a book. You repeat your question, Yesin. Mm-hmm. When can you tell yourself that you can realize a book? Read, read you mean? Uh, write a book? Write a book? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Johnny, I think it's related to creativity. It means do you decide the time in which you will start a new book or it comes genuinely? Yeah. Uh, as I, I have a file. I have a file where uh, if I get an idea, I'll just write the idea down and put it in that list or in that, list. that list goes in a file. If, if a little later I go back when I'm looking at some of my ideas yeah. and I feel like that idea can be developed into a poem or a story or a book, mm-hmm. then I will decide what is it going to be? Will it be a book? Mm-hmm. For the most part, no. When I get when I get an idea, when I get an idea, I don't know right away whether it's going to be a book, mm-hmm. a poem, or a story. But on a second, on 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 on, on a, another note, and let, let me let me tell you this now. When I speak to people about writing. There are two worlds. There are one world where if you're writing just to write, to keep a journal, to keep a diary, Mm -hmm. that's one thing. But when you're writing to be published, when you're writing for publishers, magazines, that's something else. And uh, uh, for some of my books, because I I do not have a literary agent now. I don't have an agent now. I used to have one. I had one for about for about two years. Yeah. I I would have to look at the publisher's website. Yeah. And the publisher's website, there's a section most in most cases for the writers and for the illustrators. Yeah. Uh, and it's called Guidelines for Writers 
guideline for illustrators, mm -hmm. right? When I go to a publisher's website and study their guideline for writers, then I become another person because I'm going to write something after I do research on what that publisher is looking for. I'm going to write something that hopefully that publisher is going to like and going to buy, going to uh, give me a contract on. Uh, you see, and that comes that comes because I have studied the website. I've looked at that publisher's yeah. catalog. I looked at the, the books, the kind of books that are being published, you know, because I can read the title of the book. I can, in some cases, I can read a little bit about what the book is about. I do so in reading the blur, the B-L-U-R-B, mm -hmm. which is on the back of the book in most cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I read many of the blur for the various books. Mm -hmm. And what I will try and do is, what I will try and do is come up with something, write something that will fit in that catalog. Mm -hmm. I can't write the same kind of book now, mm -hmm. but I have to write something that that uh, publisher has not published before. Okay, and I hope I answered your question. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. I move to Thank Alina. You. Alina, I think the name is correct. Alina, go ahead. Hi. I just love Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Alina, and I'm 16 years old. I'm from Turkey. Uh, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, what did you write a book about my team of Turkey? About what? Alina, you repeat your question, please. Uh, what did you write a book about Martin Luther King? Why, why did I write a book about Martin Luther King Jr.? Martin Luther King. Okay. Yeah. I, I wrote it because the publisher wanted me to write a book of about 300 words mm -hmm. about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Martin Luther King Jr. when he was a child. Uh, the publisher wanted me to write what, what I did read. I don't know. I, I hope you saw it from the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, this book here, mm -hmm. which is a forward book, yeah. and it's for uh, some toddlers, a kindergarten age mm -hmm. kids, and first and second graders. Yeah. Uh, I wrote it. I wrote it really because the publisher asked me to write it. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, other than that, oh, and one reason why the book is so popular is because there was not a board book about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. There was not a short book that could help little children exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. understand yeah. racism. Okay. And, and that's why I wrote, I wrote it. I wrote it because the publisher asked me to write it. All right. Thank you for your question. Let me interview Mr. Johnny here. Thank you. Yes, Alina, any other question? Sorry. No, thanks. OK. So let me intervene a little bit, Mr. Johnny, as you said. So and in addition to that, I think that Martin Luther King is an icon. We can't turn a blind eye to that. And toddlers, I think it is uh, really the exact age to raise awareness about that to uh, if you want to grasp this uh, uh, meaning these issues on them from an early age. So I think it's well done to write about Martin Luther King for children. I totally agree. agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, another thing, you kind of touch upon something. Mm -hmm. I told you that my, I have told you all that my specialty is writing for very young children. Yeah. And that's so dear to me because it's easier to uh, kind of give little kids ideas, yeah. good ideas, and they will take them and they're not, they're not judgmental. They will take exactly, them. Exactly, yes. And, yeah, they will take them. Yeah. And if, if you tell them, oh, it's kind of like what I do for my grandson and my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. now. Almost every day, they ask me to give them a piece of paper yeah. so they can draw, right? So they draw my granddaughter, who is 
uh, almost two years old, mm -hmm. she will she will say, draw a flower. She wants me to draw her a flower, right? Oh, so yeah. I draw a flower for her, and then I help her draw a flower. You see? And when when they're finished, and, and Ethan, grandson, he he draws all sorts of kinds of things, mm -hmm. but. I always tell them, mm -hmm. good job. I love, I love it. I I tell them, look, you're gonna be an artist. Mm -hmm. Here, you're gonna be, you're gonna be one hell of a I can I can get them you know, at their age and think about what they're gonna grow up and be. Mm -hmm. So they start they're, they're I'm planting seeds in them and they don't know what I'm really doing. I'm giving them ideas of everything they can do. So, no problem. But again, back, back to what uh, Mrs. Rajda did say. Uh, we, can, we can, if the world going to change, yeah. uh, if it's really going to change, uh, I'm going to say gradually, a little bit better than gradually, it's going to happen. Yeah. If we teach them, if we teach them the way they should be taught, if we if we do not teach them about all this racism stuff, if we do not teach them to be racist, uh, if we if we if we teach them to respect people, yeah. you know, you can be different. You can you don't have to agree with me, but let us just uh, agree to get along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you see, because I I bet you I do. I bet you I do some. This morning, yeah. when uh, Miss Raja and I were doing the sound check, yeah. audio check, and all this stuff, she was drinking her coffee, right? <laughs> yeah, I was drinking coffee. Yeah. <laughs> you just talking about coffee, right? And at that moment, I, I, I was getting ready to go work out, have a bike ride. Yeah. I wanted to, I sent her a message telling her we can do this test later mm -hmm. because I wanted her to. I want her to enjoy her coffee, right? But then I turned around and just sent a note to her saying, you know, I don't, I don't like coffee. And I don't, I don't drink coffee. Right? <laughs> but 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 she does, it's something that she enjoys, and I have no problem with that. Yeah, exactly. So it goes back to look, we got to be, we can be different, mm -hmm. but let's just respect yeah. one another differences. Tolerance. Let's get this is tolerance, yeah. That's right. That's right. Be tolerant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes. Uh, okay, Sarah, go ahead. What is your question? I saw raising your hand, Sarah. Yes. Sarah is my student, Simon. Uh, it's her mom's. Uh, yeah. If she wants to ask, to ask it's it's a boy. It's Simon. It's a boy. Sorry. But and Sophia, Sophia still has a few more questions okay. because she's working as her colleague spokesperson. So. Right. She has. No problem, no problem. She was ordered to <laughs> transmit to Mr. No Moore problem. all their questions because yes. they could not be here. So she has a whole uh, list no of questions to ask, <laughs> and I still have yeah. one too. No problem, I myself no have one question course, for you too, Mr. Moore. Okay, yes. Simon, go on. Okay, hi, Mr. Ray Moore. Uh, since you say that we will never be able to get rid of racism. Uh, have you ever thought uh, what is the best thing to do to make it better? Uh, yes, good question. And it's what it's what I have started. It's what others have started long before me. Yeah. We work with our children and teach them better. We teach them what's right versus what is wrong. But the main thing, as we have already mentioned, we got to be tolerant of one another. We got to get along. We got to respect one another. And I, and, I'm, and I can tell you, if we would do those two things, it's really not a lot you have to do. It's just because, let, let me tell you about an experience I had once when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. I, got on, I got on the bus. I was on my way to uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I was in the army. Yeah. Okay, I was going to the military post. Yeah. I got on the bus and I looked and the bus was uh it was almost full, right? So uh 
I didn't see any black people on the bus. Yeah. I was only I was only one. Mm-hmm. Right? So as I went down, I, it didn't frighten me. As I got on the bus, and was going on, I've been about one about middle way. I was looking for a seat, right? Yeah. So Just then, you. this young lady, mm-hmm. young, young white lady, she raised her hand, yeah. wanted me to know that there was a seat right beside her. Yeah. I went and sat with her, and she had her daughter. Right, her daughter was uh, one. Might have been about two years old. Right, so uh, you know we spoke to one another. Her name was Diane. This happened so many years ago, but I will never forget her. Yeah. We I, so I sat sat there, and you know we talked a little bit. And her daughter, her daughter, reached over mm-hmm. with her finger, and she did this. See what I'm doing? Yeah. To touch the skin, you mean? Yes, she, she touched my skin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was trying to see what it come off, right? Yeah. The mom got, her mother got mm-hmm. very, mm-hmm. got very embarrassed yeah. by it. I told her, I told her, no, no it's, it's okay. It's all right. Mm-hmm. It's okay, right? Yeah. She, she said, she apologized to me. Yeah. She said that. Her daughter had only seen black people on TV. Yeah. She had never seen one in person. All right, she was a child. I was not offended. I was not offended by what she was doing. Mm-hmm. I let her finish. Right. So after she finished, then she she smiled. She was just she was curious. Right. Yeah. So her mom it. and I we, mm-hmm. we became very good friends. We wrote one another yeah, for a while. Yeah. 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 But this is this is the kind of thing, yeah. I, you know. I could have very disturbing, very disturbing indeed. Yeah. Yeah, but I could have, I could have, mm-hmm. I could have, uh, I could have been offended by that and said something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but I didn't do that. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking about a child. Mm-hmm. They don't if they're not exposed to these kinds of things, then they're going to be curious like that exactly. because exactly. they are curious. Yeah. They're just curious. Yeah. So. Again, for us to kind of stamp out racism, uh, and so much, and so much other kind of stuff, you got to kind of have. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm the best at this, mm-hmm. but you got to kind of have the spirit that I have. Kind of, kind of tolerate it in order to, if you can teach a lesson. Do so, and don't, 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 don't go. We all are just curious sometimes. Yeah. I even have, uh, I have uh, uh, people, a couple of uh, white females who have never really been around uh, black people, but they find me easy to talk to. Yeah. So they they were sending me message, and every now and then, you know, we, we talk about racism. We talk about racism. I do the best I can in talking with them, but I let them know that they will never fully understand it exactly. because, you, yeah. because you're not you're not black you're not a person of color I see what you mean yeah. right you won't you won't but but again back to back to his question all we can do yeah. is keep chipping away with it and we got to try and better understand one another yeah. be tolerant of one another that's what we can that's what we can do Good question. Yes. Thank you. Christina, you still have a question to ask? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have. Yes. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Moore. Uh, and thank you for agreeing and uh, spending some time with us, sharing with us your views and your experience. Because as you said and very well right now, we will never understand fully what it is to be in your shoes because we are not and we will never be in your shoes. Mm -hmm. I remember once when my older boy was three or four years old, he saw the first uh, colored person at my school. It was uh, one of the the staff ladies Mm -hmm. and he looked up at her face and he said, look, mommy, this lady, her face is the color of chocolate. Mm -hmm. And Donna Verita, it was her name. She 
started to laugh very loud, very amused. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's because Dona Verita is a very sweet lady. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so he believed that. Well, never mind that passing on. My question was this. Since I'm Portuguese, I must ask this. Okay. Do you blame Portuguese? Do you blame Portuguese for the historical mistake of slavery and therefore for racism? No. Uh, uh, the, the, the reason being, <sighs> it's something, racism and all this other foolishness, it's something that I've been taught from the beginning of time. When, when uh, uh, the past summer, when we started having the riots and all that drama in the United States because of the death of uh, George Floyd, and it was, I, I didn't know, I didn't know whether this was going to be the end of America as we knew it or not, because what was happening was fanning from city to city, from state to state, and then it's, it, it went beyond the borders of the United States in foreign countries. I had neighbors come to me, because I, I have quite, a, there's more whites in my neighborhood than anything. They came to me and apologized to me. They felt so bad. They apologized and they assured me how much they love me, how much they love my family. I told them, you shouldn't feel that way. The reason being, everybody is not racist. Everybody is not prejudiced in that sense. I said, I said, and, and, and also, also, uh, even though you benefit from racism because of the color of your skin, I never have and never will benefit from it. But at the same time, you, you have come to the point to know that it's wrong. Your privilege is wrong, but don't feel bad about it. What I want you to do, if you want to make it better, when you get amongst some of your racist friends, whatever you want to call them, and they're talking about not just blacks, but they're talking about any race. They're looking and feeling better than any race. If you really want to help me, yeah. I want you to talk to them. Wonderful. I want you to pretty much kind of set them straight. Mm -hmm. Let them know that those kinds of stereotypes mm -hmm. got to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you're not going to do that, if you're going to just sit there and be entertained by it, then you're apologizing to me mm -hmm. for what other whites are doing to people of color mm -hmm. or any other race, this and that. It doesn't mean anything. So become active. Do something. Back to your question. No, I don't. I do not blame Portuguese for, for, for any of it because... See, you, you were, you were born in it. You were born into a world where it existed. Your, uh, your ancestors on down the road somewhere, they may have had slaves, yeah. which is the case, which is the case, right? But, but I don't, I can't blame you for it. You were born into it. You benefited from it. I'm insightful enough to know that I should not blame you for that. At the same time, we got to try to get along and I want to be treated. I want you to treat me like you would treat one of your family members, even though our skin is different. Okay. <laughs> our features are different. That's what, I, that's what I want. You see, but no, I don't. I don't. I do not blame Portugal. Thank you for your answer. So I think we still have two minutes to go. Time was magic with you, Mr. Johnny. Um, 
lost track of time, so we still have two minutes. I don't know the last speech if you would like to wrap up our webinar today. Thank you first and most for coming. It was a great pleasure seeing you. We are very honored from all the countries. The last speech is yours, yes. Okay, well, the last, what am I going to say last? What can I say? Okay, I'm just going to end with this poem. Yeah. When I was, when I was, uh, when I was in school, it was all this thing bad. My father died when I was about to go into the eighth grade. So I pretty much grew up without a father. My mom did the best she could, but it was a turbulent time. So mm -hmm. I wrote this poem entitled, Reality. Many times I've searched tonight for hope, not for fantasy, but for stability of mind. The mist of life is for a dope, a game of honest play that keep me behind. I may never be the person I should, or bother to discover the latest fad, but given the chance to change, I would, but freedom cannot be all bad. Peace and simplicity are things I must sustain, The war and hatred do exist. Someday I will experience death if it remains. Why to life and will I later insist? So my existence may well be a curse, but to die in vain would be much worse. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for all the inspiration you spread among us today. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. And take care. You too. Stay safe. So thanks, attendees. Thanks, everyone. This is the end of our, our meeting today. Maybe we will arrange more next year after the pandemic. We will visit the uh, uh, United States or you will come join us in, uh, in Tunisia. We don't know what are the possible opportunities. Thank you for inspiring us this evening. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good Bye. night, all of you.